welcome to the first of our online virtual video foraging walks and cookery classes. My name is Vix and I run the Family Foraging Kitchen and today we are out at the beautiful Maker Heights on a very sunny November day. So we are going to be taking you through a culinary journey of the hedgerow from now up until April where we'll have a little virtual tour of the hedgerow and then we're going to cook up a really simple wild recipe for you to enjoy. And if you're at home watching this and you have one of our wild food boxes, each month the, the recipe that we cook will be with one of the ingredients in your box. So I hope you enjoy this. I have a wonderful crew and team with me. Uh, we are out in the countryside and we're gonna be talking about our first plant today, which is common sorrel. Okay, so here we are with the first of our November plants and we have common sorrel. Now, lots of people say to me, Vix, what on earth do you eat in the winter? Surely there's nothing growing. What do foragers survive on? Well, that is a common misconception. In the winter, it's one of the best times to forage for all of these beautiful, fresh, young greens coming out of the grass. And the really cool thing about sorrel is that we actually have it growing all year round. So how do we know this is sorrel? Well, first of all, you need to look at the shape of the leaf. So this is an arrow shape at the top. And at the bottom, it's forked like an old coat tail. So if you look at it this way, you think Victorian coat tail. And if you look at it this way, we're thinking more like devil horns. So however you want to remember, devil horns or coat tail. Now, sorrel has a really sharp taste because it's full of something called oxalic acid, which is what gives you a lemony zing. And some people, when they eat this, think they can taste the skin of Granny Smith apples. And some people get more of a fresh taste like a lemon. What it's really great for is to shove straight in the salad bowl. So if we look down here where I've come in the grass, we've got a beautiful rosette of all these leaves and I'll hold some up for you to see. You can get very, very small baby ones like this and they actually do get as large as your hand. Now, there is a leaf that looks like this, which will burn your mouth if you get it wrong. But please don't be scared of this plant, okay? A lot of people get scared of foraging and think things are there to hurt you. There's a very easy way to tell the difference between common sorrel and the leaf that will burn you, which is called the arum lily, otherwise known as lords and ladies. Now that plant doesn't come out at this time of year, it's not a November plant, but in the spring, if you see a leaf with an arrow shape with a fork at the bottom, hold it up closely. On the arum lily, the lords and ladies, there will be a track, like a line that runs all the way around the outside of the leaf, and they call that track the road to hell, okay? There is no track on this leaf. If you're in any doubt, take the leaf and rub it on the back of your hand. By now, the arum lily will start to burn. If it's not burning and you're still in doubt, take a little piece and put it just up here and your lip and your tooth. By now that will be burning. Obviously you spit that out. This one though, it tastes like a beautiful, crispy, fresh, Granny Smith, lemony, sorrelly, yumminess leaf. So do that. Delicious. I'm gonna put those straight in my salad bowl. You can also make a beautiful pesto or a salsa verde. Pestos and salsas are not recipes, they are concepts. You can use any green leaf and sorrel is a really lovely one to do so. So I'm going to pick these now, put them in my basket and then we're going to move on to our next plant. Okay, introducing you now to what I truly believe should be the national food of Britain. We are living in a moment of time where we have food crisis and food poverty, and yet we are surrounded by one of the most nutritious, delicious, bright and vibrant edible greens that our country has to offer. And that is the common dock leaf. Now, I do not have to tell you how to identify a dock leaf. It is one of the first plants that we are taught as children. And that is because um, our grandparents probably would have said, or our parents, that if you get stung by a stinging nettle, then you come and find a dock leaf to rub on. Now, over the years, all the walks that I have done, if that's happened, people will go and run and get a dock leaf and they will take the leaf and they will rub that on the sting and they will rub and they will rub and they will rub and nothing really happens. That is because for years you have been using the wrong part of the plant. So before I talk about why this should be the national food of Britain and why it's edible, let me show you how to get rid of that nettle sting. Within the base of the dock leaf, if you pull out one of the stalks, 
and you squeeze the stem is a substance called a mucilage, which I know is a really horrible word, but that soft squidgy gel that comes out of the stem of a dock leaf is what will cure the sting of a nettle. So when you're out foraging and you get accidentally stung by a nettle, which I actually think is a really great thing, we'll come to that when we talk about nettles, but when you get stung, do pull up the stalk and not the leaf. The dock leaf is in a family of plants called the buckwheat family, and there is not an inedible buckwheat around. Any single recipe that calls for a spinach or a cabbage leaf, you can use dock leaves. Now they come in a range of shapes and sizes in different families. This one is a broadleaf dock. These are large leafy greens. Sometimes with dock leaves you'll see like this one that they've got some holes, they've had nibbles by other creatures, that's fine. Sometimes you'll see that they've got little red marks and indentations on them. Um, I don't know if you can see, this one's got a few little red circles. That is literally bruising on the plant. There's nothing wrong with it. All that means is that somebody has stood on it or an animal's passed it um, or it's been bashed against another plant in the wind. So it's gonna do you no harm whatsoever. But if you're choosing beautiful dock leaves for the plate, Obviously you're looking for the nicer, green, freshest looking leaves. Now we are going to be cooking these dock leaves up in our recipe today. We are going to be stuffing them with a spiced rice using dates and we're going to be rolling them up and then we're going to be putting those into a gorgeous, yummy, luxurious, yogurty dipping sauce. Okay, and that's good. It's so easy to do. It's so delicious. I'm going to be showing you how to do that shortly. So next time you're on your walks, take your basket with you. Please, please start eating your dock leaves. There is more iron in a dock leaf than a cabbage. Okay, so they're really really good for you and um, they're also full of vitamin c so get these get these into your system they are wonderful wonderful free food So here is number three on our list for Wild November. And as we've come to talk about the beautiful gorse flower, the lovely sunshine has come out too. And it really just emphasizes how beautifully stunning this is, not only as an ingredient, but as a, an ingredient for our soul and for our heart. And the reason why I say that is because gorse flower is a natural antidepressant. So if you suffer from seasonal affective disorder, or you're feeling kind of down or a bit moody, a bit bluesy, perhaps you had a rubbish day with your children or your husband, then this is the plant that you want to come and look for. It will naturally lift your spirits and lift your mood. And you really can't help but do that anyway when you look at how stunning it is as a colour in a dish. Now, gorse flower is also a natural um, protein. So when we're giving these a nibble, and we incorporate them with the green things in our dish, but also giving ourselves an essential nutrient to keep us healthy and keep us going. The great thing about gorse flower is on a day like this, when the sun's been shining down, they have a real coconut-like flavor to them. Quite often in the summertime, when we go down to the beach as children and we smell that coconut smell, that suntan lotion smell, that's actually the gorse that's coming off, off the hedgerow. And on an overcast day, when you taste these blooms, they have more of a pea-like flavor, um, like the casing of monge too, or garden peas. So on a bright sunny day, I tend to put these into sweet dishes like ice creams and panna cottas and sorbets. Um, and on overcast days, they go into my salad bowl um, or they get spring called onto roast potatoes or they get put in an omelette or a frittata. There's tons and tons you can do with gorse flour. You can make wine, you can make beer, you can put it in chocolate. Um, we're going to be putting it into a salad today and running it through rice. So I'm going to pick a few. Be careful when you pick it. Gorse is very prickly and they do say that when gorse goes out of flour, kissing will go out of fashion. And that is because there will always be some gorse in flour somewhere. It does go to seed and sometimes you will see the bushes without flowers on them but you will always find some somewhere in bloom. So a lovely thing, a lovely cheerful ingredient to have in the colder winter months. One thing I really, really love about wild food is that you can kind of get into the fairy folk um, mentality and the pixie mentality of ways to cook. Um, and this ingredient really does um, sum up that sort of plant law, folklore, fairy law for me. So this one here is called pennywort, um, otherwise known as navel wort. That's because its Latin name is umbilica and it's said to look like your tummy button. So if you look at the plant, it's got what looks like a little tummy button. So you can think navel wort, pennywort. The children I work with like to call them pixie umbrellas. So however you want to remember, it's up to you. And Pennywort's kind of like the UK's version of aloe vera. 
When you see the word wort or wort, W-O-R-T, after any plant, that literally sort of translates to medicinal. So now you start thinking, what other plants do I know with wort after its name? St. John's wort, for example. So how is this medicinal? Well, if you burn yourself or you have a blister or, or some or a pain on the skin, if you crush the pennywort leaf and you rub it onto your hand, it releases a cool like gel, much like an aloe, and that will really help take away a burn. So if we're, if we're in the summer months, you can take away a sunburn quite easily with that nice, cool, refreshing gel. Or if you're camping and you actually scold yourself on a fire, um, then you can use that, um, the pennywort in that way. But it's not just a medicinal, like most plants in the hedgerow, it's a beautiful wild edible. Now, pennywort, I always think, tastes like monge too. It really retains its water content. So if you're out walking and you forget your water bottle, you can quench your thirst quite easily by using one of these plants. Cooking them in recipes is great. They work really well in a stir fry. So when you're tossing all your stir fry vegetables in the sauce towards the end, throw in all your pennywort leaves. And the other thing I really like to do is if I'm having people around for dinner, I like to get a little piece of halloumi, grilled halloumi cheese and put it in the center there. And then I like to squirt on some dark, sticky balsamic glaze and just put that in the middle and goes really well with a nice Cornish ale or an IPA. Um, salad bowl, just toss it straight into the salad. Just eat it like a rabbit when you're out. They're so delicious, they're so fresh, they're so juicy, and they're a real abundant November ingredient. If you have a look at just how much is growing here, this will extend all the way down the hedgerow. They're you can't misidentify them, you can't confuse them with anything poisonous, and they're just a lovely, tasty, mild little November snack for you. So here we are in a more wooded area up at Maker Heights and people, when I say foraging, um, they always say to me, wild garlic, yeah, we love wild garlic. We come out foraging in the spring every year. Um, so it's November, as you know, um, and here we have some wild garlic. Now it's not the wild garlic that you're thinking of. Most people, when they think of wild garlic, think of what's called ramsons in America or ramps. And that is a much bigger, much thicker plant. And that is what you see carpeting woodlands in the spring. What we have growing here is three-cornered garlic. Now three-cornered garlic, or otherwise known as three-cornered leek, you'll see it described in both ways, is funnily enough, three-cornered. So when you have a look at the leaf, it's got a ridge going up the middle, one, and then it's two sides, two, three. So three corners to the leaf. Now all alliums smell really, really strongly of onion and garlic. So if you're walking past what just looks like a patch of grass like this, come and have a closer look. If you grab the leaves and you squeeze them and you release the oil, it's so strong of garlic, it's wonderful. It's, these are like a really, really strong garlicky spring onion. And I actually prefer three-cornered garlic to the stronger ramsons which you get in the spring. So you use them just like you would use a spring onion. When these come into flower, they've got beautiful white, almost like snowdroppy like flowers, uh, which have a light green stripe which runs down the side. And hopefully we'll see some in flower maybe next month when we do our next little film um, for you. So we're gonna pick some of these lovely three-cornered garlic leaves. I'm gonna use my scissors to do so and just trim them because that is good for responsible foraging. So you just trim the leaves off the tops like this and they're gonna go into our lovely dock leaf recipe. Welcome to the cookery section of our first episode of Foraging and Cooking Outdoors with the Family Foraging Kitchen. So as you can see, we are outside, we are cooking on a memorial bench. There is wind, there are gusts, but I can't recommend if you can to come outside and cook with your families. It's such a lovely experience to be outdoors, working straight with the ingredients that you've picked right there and then that day. But if you can't, take them home, do it in the kitchen. Now, just to go back through the ingredients that we picked today, number one, we have our dock leaf, very, very easy to identify, you can find them everywhere, national food of Britain. Number two, we have our common sorrel, or oxalis. If you remember, we said it's got the arrow shape at the top and the fork at the bottom of the stem. We have our pennywort, our navelwort, our umbilica, our tummy button plant. We have our three-cornered garlic, okay, with its three points. 
and we have our bright, shiny, beautiful gorse flowers. So what are we gonna do with this dish? Well, we've got our wilds, our five wild ingredients on the board here. We're gonna need a couple of shop-bought ingredients or ingredients that you can find sometimes, hopefully donated within a food box. Number one is white rice. Cheapest chips. You can go into a supermarket and you can pick up some white rice quite cheaply. Um, I got this from my local uh, grocery store, Widdicombs. If you live in Millbrook, do go and support Widdicombs. They're a wonderful uh, grocer and wholesale shop. Then I have some oil. Now you can use any oil. I've gone for an olive oil here because I like to work with olive oil. Use what oil you have in your house. Don't go and rush out and buy ingredients when you have something you could use already. I've got some balsamic vinegar. That's just because I like it. I've got some natural yogurt and I have a lemon and I've got some dates. Now, the dual dates are my favourite. I think they're like nature's caramels, nature's sweeties. You could use raisins, you could use apricots, you could use any soft fruit that you have. You don't have to use them at all. You could leave them out. They're just a favourite of mine. So what am I going to do? In this saucepan, I have got some white rice that's been boiling now for about six minutes. So a couple of minutes left and we'll turn that off. Whilst that's coming up nicely to being done, we're going to put our dock leaves into a bowl and then we're just going to blanch them with a little bit of hot water. So pop those in there, pour in the boiling water on top of the dock leaves. Now, the reason why I pour that on is not to cook them, but it's just to blanch them slightly, making them easier to work with. So you just pop boiling hot water onto your dock leaves. So I'm going to tell you why and how we're going to use those in a minute. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take some of the stones out of our dates. We're going to give those back to the hedge. The next thing I'm going to do is turn the rice off, let that just steam, chop my lemon in half. Lovely. Scoop out some of my yogurt into a bowl. Now the reason why I'm doing this, this is going to be a little dip and what we're going to do is we're going to spice the rice wrap it in the dock leaves and dip it into that lovely umptious yogurt. Well, I want this yogurt to be a little bit special. So I'm going to take some of the three-cornered garlic and I'm just going to wrap it into that yogurt. Now you could use a spring onion if you didn't have three-cornered garlic. Um, you could use just a bit of grated white or red onion. But we've got this beautiful wild three-cornered. So we're going to put that in there. You can see dish. I'm going to put some of this lovely yellow gorse flower in there as well. That gives it a beautiful colour, makes it really attractive against the white yoghurt and it's just a little bowl of happiness all ready for us to smoosh things and dip into. How simple is that? Let's just put, because I like to make food beautiful, a little pennywort leaf on the top. So that's your dish. Perfect for your dish. Now, I'm a very messy cook, as you all know, who have been out on walks with me before. Let's move that there. I'm going to chop some of these dates up, just roughly, with your knife. They're very sticky. Raisins aren't as sticky, so if you, if you had raisins instead of dates, you could just pop those straight into the bowl. So take that off. The rice is nice and cooked. Dates going in the rice. So that's my first ingredient in the pot. And then I'm going to want a sour flavour with the sweet. When I'm cooking, I like to balance flavours. I like to have the sweet and the sour um, and the salt. Mix it all together, make it umami, lovely and tasty. So here we go, our lemon, our ox uh, oxalic acid, our common sorrel. Just rip, rip, rip them with your hands, rough chop or rip, and put those again mixed in with the dates in the rice. Lovely, lovely. And why not also put some of your three-cornered garlic whilst we're here into that mixture as well. Right, in there, in there, in there. So a two-year-old could do this. In fact, my two-year-old, who is now three, used to do this himself. It's like teaching a grandmother to suck eggs. There is nothing master chef about this. This is a really easy family lunchtime idea that anyone could do. So then, with my spoon, I'm going to mix those lovely ingredients through the rice. Now you can put as much in as you like. 
I am not a cook that goes by quantity. I go by eye and I put in as much as I have that I've picked that day. I can ram in to taste. So let's not waste anything. Let's put those last little leaves in now. So stock leaves have been in that hot water long enough. I'm just going to carefully strain that water off without burning myself, hopefully. Now, wilted dock leaves. Take your dock leaves. Now, the bigger your dock, the better. Why? Because you can get more on it. We found some smaller ones today, so we will use what we found. Get a nice scoop of your ricey mixture. Watch you don't burn your fingers. Roll it round. Pop that onto your plate. Now, as you're making these, that mixture will cool so that when you come to the end of your rolling, you should be able to scoff to your heart's content. Be careful with the leaves with holes in so you don't burn your hand. And a smaller spoon might be a good idea. Get that nice bit of garlic on there. Roll it up. Be as messy as you will. This is not gourmet fine dining. This is scrummy, yummy lunch times. Shove it in and enjoy. Let's take another oh, let's not bash your ingredients over on the desk. Take another leaf there. That's a nice one. I really like to work with big dock leaves doing this dish normally because you can get much more of this stuffing inside. But hey, this is just to show you what to do. You go nuts. You, I like to play a game called how big is your dock? So you can see how big your dock leaves are and maybe send them in, send in your dock leaf pictures. Maybe the biggest one could win a prize, who knows? So, another one here, let's do one more. Just to show you. This bit there, roll it round that rice in Put it on the plate. Now do as many of those as you think you can eat. To finish with your lemon, a nice squeeze of lemon over the top and a little glug of oil. You don't need too much, it just helps to hold it in together and fat in your diet is good. It's a misconception that fats are bad. Some fats are good for you and should be encouraged. We need to have a balanced diet. Now, just tart that dish up a little bit with some extra flowers. Make it look beautiful. Pop your fresh pennywort leaves on the plate. We've lost some of ours to the wind. Ah, we've lost another one to the wind. Let's see, we've got some more in our basket so we can just go in here. A few more flowers. A little tiny bit of balsamic vinegar. And there we have a little lunchtime amuse-bouche. So all you do is you pick it up, dunk it in, be messy. And do the wild wiggle dance. So good. So many flavours. Onion, coconut, lemon. Oh, so nice. That pennywort, that pea-like flavour, yummy. If you didn't get pennywort in, then just go back to the plate. Mm. The dates, the caramel, it works really nicely. Give it a go, give it a try. Tell me what you think.